Hello, global audience. Welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. We will do 20 minutes of shop talk, tech talk, learning from the master, and then 20 minutes of answering, more or less answering questions from you guys, the global audience. So please, please write in because this is your time to get real answers from um, one of the best in the business. My name is Liz Hinline. I am a creative director and filmmaker. And today I am so grateful and pleased to present Shane Hurlbutt, who is a brilliant, masterful cinematographer, um, Terminator Salvation, Drumline, Acts of Valor, brilliant. Shane, would you come on and drop your knowledge with us, please? Absolutely. Hello. Hey, Liz, how you doing? Hi, welcome from not New Orleans. <laughs> exactly. So great seeing you. Um, so audience, we've been already talking about, you know, Shane is, is, what I tell students a lot when I talk is that every master in the field is also always educating themselves. They never stop learning or growing or, tr or trying to be better. And it was really amazing how beautiful and humble Shane is. He talked about that how during pandemic, he took the time to be better at prep. And we both discussed that that is something, prepping as a director, prepping as a cinematographer, prepping in any of the departments is never taught. And Shane really you know, has a passion for sharing knowledge, which is really unique. Um, and we would love to just hear more. What, what have you found over the years with 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 people in prep? Because it seems to be there's no apprenticeship anymore. No, there really isn't. And you know, when I started my first feature, I remember you know Rob Cohen. I did this film for Universal called The Skulls, and and uh, you know before that we did The Rat Pack, and that was kind of my first narrative piece. And you know, I didn't know how to prep a movie. Uh, I didn't understand what my, uh, you know, duties were other than, you know, framing a shot and lighting the shot, you know, so as, as I went along, I started to, you know, find my kind of sea legs and prep, but I was never, um, I, let me say that I, I got more involved in the camera and, and the lighting and not really on the production side of like, working uh, really closely with the assistant director and uh, to schedule it. And, and, you know, those are the kind of things that started to come later uh, after the third or fourth movie, really understanding, okay, this is so important for me to really, you know, rifle down and work on the schedule. But then during the pandemic, I was like, I'm going to blow this all up. I'm going to like start anew. Uh, I know what my responsibilities are as a director of photography. I know I have to also be very supportive and inspiring and uniting my crew to take the hill. And I also have to work very closely with production to try and fit the vision that I, my vision is usually 700% that I got to fit into a hundred percent budgetary box. So I got to somehow take that and, and funnel it into it. And this prep process that I developed during the pandemic does that. It takes your $20 million budget or $15 million budget and gives you an $80 million look because you actually have done the work as a cinematographer. And I don't, it's, I, it's not that I don't think that DPs uh, are, are lazy in that regards. I just think they, a lot of people just don't know how to prep effectively. Everyone wants to get to the shoot, but mm -hmm. uh, with COVID now and the 10 hour day restrictions, you have to be so organized and on point. And if you are not, you are not gonna be making your days. You're not gonna be giving your director mm -hmm. the time that he or she needs to really get the the performances that's that's needed. So. My whole thing is, is my prep has increased and, you know, working with uh, the last round on these two movies, when I came into it, they were like, okay, we have four weeks of prep for you. And I go double it. And they're like, what? I said, yeah, if the movie's six weeks long, I need eight weeks of prep. And they're like, yeah, but that's not how it works. I said, that's how it works in COVID. 
because right. if I am not completely buttoned up with the shot list and everyone mm -hmm. knowing the communicating the vision is the most difficult thing we do as directors and cinematographers. Mm -hmm. So we're educating all the teams so they can be at their very best. So this was the process of, of uh, really analyzing where I had to focus and how I had to communicate and then creating a, a, a slew of documents that then unite that team and communicate the vision the most effectively. And in prep, what do you, what is like the critical things that have to be accomplished by you or, or all is lost? Well, the first thing is how do you, uh, you know, bring your vision down into a 35 day schedule, let's say, mm -hmm. or a 40 day schedule, you know, whatever it is, a 90 day schedule, whatever the schedule is. And it, mm -hmm. you usually once, Every time I come into a movie, it's the same scenario. Well, we're four days over and we got to get it down into this, you know, 50 day box or 30 day box. So that's the first thing is how can we, with the choice of locations, with, you know, making base camps not have to move, uh, designing it so we don't have to move so much. So we stay at a location and we hit that location hard. Uh, mm -hmm. That's going to, again, create money that's saved as well as efficiency for the crew. And then, you know, it's like, it's the shot list is everything that tells the art department and the set decorators and everyone how much they got to build and what, how, where they're going to put their efforts. If, if I'm not seeing two walls, then why dress them? You know, and, and this is done very early on in this document that you have that I've shared with you goes out to every uh, head of department so they know exactly uh, what we're up to. So when you're starting out, say it's with, because it seems like you work a lot with, uh, you know, say the same director, which is awesome. So you have continuous business and, and creative vision. But if you're working with a new director, like say we'll start with the shot list, where, how, how do you get them up to speed so the, you know, that's usually like the pulling teeth in sometimes because absolutely you're, you're losing the organicness in a way. Correct. Uh, you know, the, it, it varies radically. Like there's mm -hmm. some directors that are, are, you know, don't want a shot list. Uh, they'll just do like little blocking schematics. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some that um, are love storyboards and want storyboards on everything. Um, the storyboards are all good, but a shot describes, I don't know, a, a shot list is more viable for me and everyone mm -hmm. else because it's something that can be generated very quickly and, and the conversation with the, the director and myself where, you know, when you start to interject storyboards and it's the director working with the storyboard artists and then I'm working with them and then we're trying to get it all together and it's two or three or four rounds of iteration, it's not efficient. Right. And in this world that we're in now where, you know, we can't work past 10 hours, we have to find the most efficient uh, plan uh, that's going to uh, work with our budget and our schedule. And so what, so what, so you're going into prep and now you, now you have a system because I, it, you seem like a guy that loves systems. Like once the system is set, then you can sort of be free and creative, you know? Yes. So what is the, one of the first documents that you've now designed that you feel like is your starting point? Yeah. So the first thing is the shot list along with the blocking schematic. So this is done for every scene. Uh, wow. No scene is left unturned because yeah. By doing, by doing the work and taking the time to do the blocking schematic, everyone knows where the camera goes. It, it's insane. It's like these documents that you're gonna share mm -hmm. show up in the, the, the uh, hands of everyone on set, the key grip, the gaffer, the operators. They, I don't have to say anything in the morning. They're already setting cameras up in the wherever they are in the location because they've looked at the schematic. They know what the first shot is, uh, and they just—it's like uh, everything just works so beautifully. And I have to say, I have so much fun now because I'm not stressed of trying to figure it out on the day. It's all figured out. 
we know where everything is going to go. We know where all the actors are going to go. We all know where all the cameras are going to go. The lighting team knows exactly where all the lights are going to go. It's like you come in and you just have fun. You laugh your ass off and have fun all day. That is wow. great prep. Wow. Wow. Do we have a blocking? Is one of the documents we have? Zach? Yeah, you have the shot list document if you could share that. Thank you, Zach. So maybe you want to just explain what we're looking at or where we could yeah, roll through so some of this. This is like the first scene of the movie, uh, this trendy clothing store. And that is the schematic for this location. So you're obviously seeing, uh, you know, the, the five shots that are needed within this scene to complete it. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're all there. And then what I do is I've set this up in pages. And Pages has a wonderful collaboration mode. So mm. once I start to put this document together, I then share it with the director so she can see it. I share it with the AD so uh, she can see it. And then she orders all the shots in the correct order. And then by doing this, we were able to save two days on production. So we had a 36 day schedule. Netflix wanted this budget cut down uh, so we had to uh, go in there and we had to, um, you know, really, uh, we had to cut two days. And mm -hmm. be, because we had prepped so well and planned it out, we were able to strategically and, and systematically, because we saw the whole vision, cut the days and not sacrifice the, uh, you know, the vision. So my question for you, Shane, is did you go on location with the director and physically like block it out yourselves? Like, how did Absolutely. you get to this blocking? Yes, exactly. So uh, first we do it in a vacuum. Everything mm -hmm. is done in a vacuum. So uh, we'll, we'll start to see location pictures. And then I uh, am very into this Insta360 camera that's a full VR cam. I, mm -hmm. I take my little magic stick and I move it throughout every room. Uh, so once that's done, uh, we're sitting there and we're able to pull up that Insta360. I'm able to see the whole room, you know, floor, ceiling, uh, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And then I draw it based on uh, what I'm seeing. And this is like that trendy store. If you can go down a couple more, they get a little more advanced. Um, you know, like here's one. Uh, yeah, like this is like the cafeteria scene that we had in, in a hallway. So, you know, these are things that, uh, you know, right off the bat, we had this scene. It was like scene 27, I think it is, was this big, massive one -er that was a five minute shot. And it was in wow. this uh, cafeteria. And when we were conceiving it, I was like going to the the production designer is like, I need schematics on this space and how you're going to splay out these cafeteria tables so we can start to work out mm -hmm. this wonder. So he's like frantically trying to get me any kind of schematic early on so we can see the physicality of where I can move the camera. And so he's like generating these documents and I'm slapping them in the schematic. And then, you know, Emily Ting, the director and I were, you know, moving it all around. So you know, you, you asked this question about working with different directors. Emily mm -hmm. Ting is a prep goddess, okay? <laughs> she loves to prep. So for two weeks, all we did is just sit in my hotel room uh, with the all my big monitors and all my schematics and everything, and we just literally shot listed the whole movie. Wow. And then when we went to the locations, uh, we then would revise them based on seeing the locations and picking it and then doing, you know, Artemis shots and everything. Mm -hmm. We would then finesse it. So first the vacuum and then the finesse. So then my question is, so you're on the day and you're with, let's say some big talent and the big talent, we, you go through the blocking or Emily goes through the blocking they're like, mm, actually my character wouldn't go to the bed. My character would go lean out the window. So now the shot list that you guys have perfected and lit to is sort of slowly filtering into, you know, Wonderland. What happens then? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Because we're so prepared, uh, mm. we can easily uh, take that curveball. 
uh, mm -hmm. and, and adjust. And, you know, there was definitely times like that. I mean, it happens on every movie. Sometimes, you know, there's just not the motivation that we thought in our head that this would be right. the motivation for the character. And they're like, no, that's not where I'm seeing it. And then we mm -hmm. discuss that. And then we come up with a plan B. But that plan B is, you know, done very quickly because we had so much planning and, and we had the, the place pre-lit. I mean, based on this prep i'm able to get my rigging team in there and when i walk in the set is lit amazing Completely lit and amazing. i am just finessing and then i'm mm -hmm. like all right within an hour of every day i was able to give emily the set and she was able to rock and roll and she had all her time to work with the actors mm -hmm. and really get the performances that she wanted I would love to, Zach, let's look at the lighting schematic that uh, Shane made that's like a piece of art, basically. <laughs> so take a look. So this is what, so this document, after you've gotten the locations, is when, when, when are you making your lighting uh, design? Yeah, so once we've finessed uh, based on the, um, on the locations, you know, seeing the locations and me kind of doing the Insta360 stick and stuff like mm -hmm. that, then I'll come back on the weekends and I'll start putting all the lighting, lighting schematics together. Uh, you know, during prep, I take no days off. Uh, yeah. So it's like I'm working, you know, five days, go and see the locations, in and out of meetings, all that kind of stuff. And then the weekend is my time to put on my headphones, uh, go in the space of, of, you know, my music, and then uh, develop these lighting schematics. So is that no, just before you pass on that, uh, just as an at your level of ASC DP, which you know you've done such huge movies and the amount of stuff that you're putting into every movie, do you find that's normal that 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 people of your experience are taking off their weekends at this point? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I my my whole thing is I feel like I'm the luckiest uh, person alive to be able to be doing what I do. Yeah. Uh, I just love it so much. I cannot believe that they pay us to do what we do because it's just a, it's every day on set is like, people always ask you my, I have one response. How are you doing Shane? Freaking fantastic. Every single day. It's never changes from the beginning of day prep one all the way to the wrap. And it's something that everyone asks you every day and you respond the same way. Emily goes, you know what? I love this. I've never had a DP that's so happy. They're usually mm. grumpy and always worried <laughs> about this, that, and the other thing. And I just, like I said, I, I come in with the biggest smile every day and I try to inspire and fire up people to, to really give me their all. Uh, and, you know, right. I hold people accountable as well when they're when they're not moving at the speed that I know I need to move at, I, I'm, you know, going to tell them that it's not mm -hmm. like, you know, we're just going to sit there. And I know, you know, this is a big break for Emily. This was her first studio movie. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of pressure uh, and, and stress on all of us that we were sharing because we wanted her coming out of the gate, you know, with 12 guns blazing. And we wanted to support her as much as possible to make that a reality. So on this type of project, were you bringing in like your home team, like your your people that that you can trust to support you, so you can support her? Yes. So uh, how that usually works is depending on the budget and the location that you're at, and how much it costs to bring people in. I always try to work with local talent first, okay, and foremost. I try to find my dream team there. And because I had done Into the Badlands, Act of Valor, and Mr. 3000 in New Orleans, I was able to use uh, a crew that I had worked with on for three movies. Uh, and then I brought my secret weapon in, Jason Robbins, my gimbal operator and B-camera guy. That's the only person I brought in. He brings his whole Ronin kit and his anti-gravity rig and all that stuff because the gimbal is very much on how I'm able to make my days and uh, move the camera so it immerses the audience. Interesting. That's a whole other thing. Well, we'll go back to our lighting, but uh, you know, you're, you have so many great things to say that I've 
so curious about things but tell us yeah. you know anything you want to tell us about your your yeah, approach so to the lighting you can kind of see you know that i'm i'm having these 418 k's blazing in the windows here and i'm going to be looking out those windows on like shot two so i either have to suspend them on rock and roll truss or use them and put them in between the gaps in the windows and be able to hide the stands and the light uh, this one, we ended up saving money. I didn't go with the rock and roll truss. Uh, we were able to hide the 18 Ks between uh, the gaps in the windows. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see kind of the S60 slung up there uh, with a big ass octobank and you see the changing rooms. So I put this huge uh, Max Menace arm and because the changing room has no roof on it, I was able to put the Max Menace arm in there and arm it out and load the S60 onto it. And that was the key light for them. Uh, so they looked really beautiful in the mirror. And this was the intro to the whole movie. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted them to look uh, awesome. And then I do my little, you know, um, map down here where you know what is a dado light, what's an S60, what's rock and roll truss. If you can scroll down like uh, three or four more, uh, they're probably gonna get a little more, um, you know, this is like a schematic of the uh, of the high school that we shot in. So this is what we were doing here uh, for scene seven. Uh, you can go down some more, uh, but all this is in the very cheesiest graphics program with Apple. It it, go, it dates back to iDraw. Uh, so you can go on graphics, you can go on Apple's website and you can download it. I think it's like 1999. And then what I do is I'm able to uh, create all these icons and then I put them in all these different folders. So everything mm -hmm. is created and I'm just dragging and dropping in. And, and who gets this document? This gets uh, my lighting schematics go to uh, my key grip, my rigging grip, my rigging gaffer and my uh, gaffer. Uh, and then what basically uh, imagine this, if you said, okay, I'm going to go into this house and we're going to light the living room and dining room for day interiors, they're, they're going to assume two or three different ways. They're going to assume, oh, wait, maybe he's, uh, going to use every light on our truck, or maybe it's a little natural light scenario. Mm -hmm. So this document tells them exactly what I'm going to use. Mm. There's no uh swaying one way or the other and you know one of these documents are essential before the gaffer and grip are even on the movie because i want to be able to hand them this because they have to crank out how many man days they have budgeted how many rigging days they have budgeted all these things production's asking for immediately so how many man days do you have how many this mm -hmm. and how many of that well if you don't have a document like this that schematic to every single location, they're flying blind. So when mm -hmm. they fly blind, they protect themselves and they cover their ass. And sure. when they cover their ass, that means my budget goes up substantially. And by the covering ass, that means they won't do necessarily tell you that they're covering their ass. And that money is hard to get back. And once you spend it, it's hard to you know move it around. Uh, oh, so with this, it really educates production and my team to exactly what I'm asking them to do on each day. And they were so strategic and they were able to make it all work with the mandates because when production saw these schematics start coming in and the, the lighting and grip numbers, they were like, there's no way we can afford this, Shane. And I go, trust me, once they start to see it, once they start to digest it, they're going to right. come up with a way to make this efficient. And that was the thing. It's like, I'm going to give you the keys to the castle. Now unlock the son of a bitch and give me my movie on budget. Right. That's that's uh, all I'm asking them. It's like and now if you pull up that daily prep document. Let's look at that. That's side. The, yeah, that's a culmination of everything. So now we've done all this work mm -hmm. and now my assistant Po Chan sends out this document every day. And what it is, is it's not only a reminder for my crew, it's also a reminder for me, because you mm. know, you're doing so many things in so many different days. So go back to the first page of that document. 
Okay, so this is what uh, it's scene 62, uh, interior theater, uh, closing number, a lot of living to do. So this was a big bye bye birdie kind of uh, scenario here mm -hmm. uh, for the musical. And it describes the whole light of what it's going to feel like. So this document is so important, the look, because what the look document does is I send it to hair, makeup, wardrobe, set deck, everything, because we color block, right? So mm -hmm. I color block with the paint colors on the walls. I color block with what they're wearing. I color block with what the bed sheets are and the pillows. I color block with what the, the books are on the shelves. Everything is color blocked. So then once I see what the color blocking is, then I do the look. So it's like, it's accenting that in regards mm -hmm. to what my color of light is coming into the room, what the tone, what the mood is feeling. Is there a, in, in early in your discussions with the director, is there some type of lookbook that either of you create or a visual referencing? Do you yes, start absolutely. with that language? Yeah, in she, she did a, a huge lookbook and a tone deck that she presented to Netflix and it was extensive. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best ones I've ever seen from a director. And that gave me uh, a, a, like the brick and mortar. And then mm -hmm. once the brick and mortar was there, then we started to shape the whole grand vision together. Now, and if what, you scroll down from there, sorry, uh, you, you see the whole schematic, you see a reference uh, picture up there, what uh, you know the production designer has put together. Uh, you see the whole shot list, and then you go into the camera section and it's telling the camera department exactly what they're going to need to deploy on that day then you go mm -hmm. to the lighting and the lighting needs to know that i gotta have two xenon super troopers i got top light pools i gotta you know i got led leakos i got top light pools on the scaffolding i got all these things scroll to the next one if you don't mind um and it's it's all these lighting notes that are put in the document and grip notes so the grips know that they're going to be running two dollies they know that they got to lay 120 foot of dolly track uh they know that there's going to be some rock and roll truss in there so this really starts to not only is this already been planned out and we all know what this is this is just a daily reminder so you know i'm like it's the kind of thing where when you do the whole vision in a vacuum and you're putting, oh yeah, when we do this, uh, uh, you know, uh, panic attack cam, I want to shoot at 135 degree shutter. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do this at 48 frames. Well, you've got so many things going on. Sometimes you forget about those things. Right. So this document comes to you every morning and I just, it's, it's my thing that comes in at the preliminary call sheet. And then when I go home at night, I look over this document and I know exactly it prepares myself. Mm -hmm. I analyze the shots. I work in my mind how we're going to start it and what are the, the, where the problems could be. And then I go to bed completely prepared, knowing exactly what I'm going to do. And then I walk in and everyone else has this document and we go as a united team. That's awesome. Okay, Zach, stop sharing if you would, please. So um, Jane, we have a bunch of questions. I'm going to jump in sure. to, to our audience. Um, so Rebecca asks, how can this be applied in your, your prep documents to hair, makeup, and wardrobe? They have the potential to slow the entire day. However, they even if they are given a lot of information, I think that's her question. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, again, you know, when you're doing color blocking with wardrobe and color blocking with the sets and the paint designs and the lighting a lot of these wardrobe decisions are, have already been made. Uh, and they've been made, you know, not for the whole movie. Let's say we're able to do one week at a time. And uh, the executive producer and the director and the wardrobe, you know, costume design are working concurrently to keep everything up to date. But yeah, there's always those slowdowns where like, that's not the hair we talked about. And, you know, somehow that got, that fell through the cracks. And we got to go back and, and redo the hair. But these are the things that you're preparing for. When you have a plan that's so well put together, you can have these curveballs all the time and still not lose your day and do not lose momentum other than waiting for the hair to come in and then you start cranking it up again. So I think that the look document is basically set there 
So mm -hmm. they know the color tone. I don't want to right. be dressing people in orange clothes if I'm rifling in late afternoon, mm -hmm. you know, golden light. It's going to be a hat on a hat. So this is a document that then immediately they see that and they're like, oh, well, maybe, the, you know, this is a late afternoon feeling here. I don't think this color is going to work. And these conversations happen, you know, on the fourth week of prep before we go into, you know, so we have four weeks for right. uh, wardrobe and hair and makeup to work out these things because I've done so much of that job early on in the first four weeks of my prep. So I'm able to share this vision and that way they, they can be, get ahead of it. Um, sort of uh, in lines with that, uh, Rhonda asks, because say you become in, she goes, have you ever been called into the middle of a project to, to take over or cover for someone else? So that, that how would you, I guess, get them geared into this mind thought of being you know, prepared and stuff quickly? Yeah, uh, let's see, that's only happened about once, I think, in my career. Uh, it was reshoots on this TV show called The Mist. Uh, I was flown up to uh, Halifax and, and uh, you know, went in there and uh, I was working with the whole crew that had done The Mist and uh, the director that had done two episodes, uh, Guy Ferlin had asked me back to come in and do this episode, uh, these pickups. And, you know, my first call is right to the director of photography. I, I call him up and I said, what was your inspiration? Where, what were you mm. going with? And then he was so nice. He shared photos with me and showed me what his inspiration was and what his style was, what lenses he was using, all that kind of stuff. We had a good hour and a half conversation. That, for, for the amount of times that people have taken over, like I've shot the pilot and the mm -hmm. person that took it over never has called me. Uh, wow. This is just a... a a, you know, a, a shout out to those DPs, that's a big mistake, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to be able to call the director of photography and find out what their, uh, you know, process was because you want to, um, you want to make it so it's seamless. And yeah. the way you do that is by communication not by trying to figure out what I used or whatever, or looking at an old camera list. That's like so like bad forensic files without DNA, <laughs> right? It's like, I need the DNA. Well, the DNA is, is talking to the cinematographer, you know, right. and saying, hey, so what were you up to? What was your inspiration? Can you share a lookbook? You know, all that kind of stuff. I got it all, I'll share it, you know, it's all there. But they just don't ask. And that's not a good thing. You know, it's like, you wanna, and, you know, I did some reshoots on Love Hard uh, when I was up, uh, I was in uh, New Orleans and, mm -hmm. you know, I got one of my second unit DPs that I always use uh, and I asked him to come in and do the pickups for me. And I sent him all the uh, quote unquote, I do this, I use the DIT in a very different way. The DIT mm -hmm. is not there moving balls and all that crap and designing looks. He he or she is the epicenter to the camera department. The second ACs do not take any notes. They don't take any camera logs. They don't do shit. They just keep the, the thing moving. So mm -hmm. assistance, you know, filters, all that kind of stuff, moving to the next setup, what they should be doing, not this clinical uh, clerical bullshit. So the DIT sitting at this main thing folds us all in because all metadata is lost nowadays. We have all these different right. systems right. and the minute you shoot your camera, the metadata is tossed to the side. So you never know what the hell it is. So when I do this, he loads this all into a uh, palm fort or whatever that thing is in live mm -hmm. grade and he, all those notes are in there. So when wow. Mikey came to me and said, you know, Shane, what do you, you know, these are the scenes you're shooting. I just sent him that whole document. And I said, all you got to do is go into the document, put, you know, command F, find scene 35. Boom. It tells you the height of the camera, the distance wow. that I was away, the color temp, the, you know, he takes all those notes, angle, declination. This is not even uh, meant to do a VFX shot, but I still have them inclinate everything because I've been burned so many times. We're like, ah, oh, we're going to do a special VFX shot on that. 
uh, what was the inclination? Well, this wasn't mm-hmm. ever going to be a VFX shot. Right. So this kind of covers your ass overall. And the DIT's main responsibility is collecting all this data that goes into one document that I can then share. And the, the rewards of this were unbelievable. Like That's- what I saw daily wise was right on par. Everything that Mike wow. Svitak, my second unit DP shot, was so right on the money. Well, that's amazing because you know that was a test for Mike, and then you know you gave him the material to win. Exactly. Basically, yeah. instead of to fall on his face. And um, he was the first one that said, "Hey Shane, what do you got for me?" You know, and he did right. everything that was right. Call up the right. director of photography, discuss the look. I shared him like all my documents, all the because I had a, I do a very weird thing with filters, you know, a lot of digital diffusions and they're all gauged per different lens. So I sent him that and he's like, holy shit, I only <laughs> use a filter when I go in for a close up." I go, no, 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 no. You have to use this filter on every lens that you shoot, 15 mil, why? You know, and he's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> um, we're almost at, sadly, we could do this for days, but we're, we're getting to the end of our, our wonderful chat here. One thing I'm just really curious is you're so imaginative. Where do you get your inspiration from these days? My inspiration is, is really on just looking at art, looking at architecture, uh, looking at photography, and also, you know, a lot of uh, amazing cinematographers and directors inspire the hell out of me. I mean, I'm just constantly amazed with with what all of these incredible artists are doing. And I just, Mm -hmm. I I call it the, you know, my look is the Shane Hurlbut mixtape. I'm grabbing from a little Deacons. I'm Mm -hmm. grabbing from a little Bob Richardson. I got Chivo over here. I got, you know, Eric Messerschmidt. I, you know, it's like I'm grabbing all these different styles that you Mm -hmm. see. And I formulate a a mixtape that's Shane Hurlbut. You know, it's like the original ideas where we are in this world are, uh, everyone's already had an idea. It's how you mix them up and shake it all up and and make it your own is is I think where where you know you are as an artist. Amazing. And where can people track you? You know, not stalk you, but like <laughs> find you yeah. know learn more about you, see your work, and 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 you know get in your aura. Yeah. So uh, I'm Shane Hurlbut ASC on Instagram. Um, I, I, uh, have, uh, Shane Hurlbut ASC.com is my portfolio site. And then just like I've been sharing all this knowledge with you, I share this knowledge on a grand scale mm-hmm. at the Hurlbut Academy, which is a, uh, online cinematography directing kind of, uh, you know, filmmakers resource, uh, that, uh, my wife, uh, CEO, Lydia Hurlbut has uh, designed and developed uh, to share the knowledge to uh, filmmakers all over the world. That's amazing. And it's so generous and amazing that you share your knowledge and it's really, you know, impressive. And, and we're oh, so, so lucky to, to, <laughs> to get to know you a little bit. Um, and so sadly, let me look, check the time. Sadly, we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much, Shane. This has been like, awesome like awe inspiring and great at the same time so it's awesome um and we super enjoyed it and audiences go track shane he's brilliant and um well, and there we go so much, Liz. yeah it was so wonderful doing this and i love the format format's really cool we get in there we're uh strategic and and toss the golden nuggets in quick and so people can actually take something away from it i find that if you shower them with too much it's too much to take in, you know, this is why we just focused on the documents that is all about the communication channel. So that's, that's very important. A hundred percent. And thank you, New York Film Academy for sponsoring the yeah, 2020 thank series. thank you so much, New York Film Academy. <laughs> and we'll see you guys later. Bye. All right. Take care, everyone.